Ah yes, what a wonderful day in the middle of nowhere in particular. Turtle mortal, I'm gonna kill you with my fire breath that I have. <laughs> oh no, I don't want to die. So this is my Atari 2600 game. What do you think, Obfuscate? Uh, why am I the bad guy? That's supposed to be me, right? Well, um, it's because you're big and scary looking, of course. <gasps> Cornelius, how could you? Um, well, this is awkward. <laughs> Maybe we should cut to the actual video now instead of dwelling on this terrible... The Atari 2600 was one of the game consoles of all time. It was released in 1977, and before that, most of the home consoles that existed were only able to play one game, usually Pong, that was hardwired into the console. Or you could get the Magnavox Odyssey which had cartridges, and needed your TV to be this exact size to fit one of these silly overlays so you can tell what the white squares on it meant. As a result, when the Atari 2600 came out with its swappable cartridge that had entire games on them, no TV overlay necessary, it was a major step up. Though it was still the late 70s, so the games didn't look great. Hey, it's not that bad. You just need to use your imagination. See that square? That's actually me wearing a suit of armor and carrying a sword. If you squint. And yeah, while Adventure looks very abstract and primitive, some of the games that were released by companies that weren't Atari, such as Activision with Pitfall, look really advanced for the hardware. Unfortunately, the Atari 2600 age did not last, since a lot of the games were straight up bad. Like the Pac-Man port! Oh no, oh god, the flicker! I don't care what the specs for the console are. When a game does this, it's unacceptable. This was the best-selling game on the Atari 2600, by the way. There was also the incredibly rushed E.T. game that they really wanted to release before Christmas in 1982. They managed to sell loads of copies on name recognition alone. Until everyone that bought it returned their copies, saying Pitfall was better, and they buried them all in a landfill. An urban legend that was confirmed when someone dug up the landfill and found all the cartridges there. The combination of bad first-party games like E.T. and Pac-Man, and an oversaturation of bad third-party games and clones, led the entire video game industry to collapse in 1983. The industry recovered by 1985, but by that time, the industry had moved on to someone else, who was actually putting an effort to ensure third-party games didn't suck. Now scram and don't come back! But what was the Atari 2600 actually like to program for? And how did you program games for it? Today, I'm going to be walking you guys through the process of creating an unbelievably simple Atari 2600 game. This unbelievably simple Atari 2600 game is called Survive. In the game, you control this turtle who is avoiding being killed by fireballs shot by the evil monster known as Obfuscate. What? Evil monster? Turtle, is that how you see me? Fine then, I'll embrace being the villain. <laughs> okay, I thought you did that a long time ago. But anyway, each time a bullet passes you, you get one point, and when you collide with one, you die. Extremely simple. I made this on a TI-84 calculator once. Making it on the 2600 was harder. The Atari 2600 runs on an inexpensive 8-bit microprocessor called the 6507 by Moss Technology. It's a member of the 6502 family of microprocessors, which power many computers from this era, such as the NES, Apple II, Commodore 64, and many others. Now you might be thinking, if the processor for the Atari is so similar to the processor for all of these computers, they'd use the same instruction set, right? And yes, they do. They all use the 6502 instruction set. So they'd all be the same difficulty to program then, right? Not necessarily. The Atari 2600 had a wonderfully terrible video chip that is the source of most of the difficulty in programming the 2600. It's called the TIA, or Television Interface Adapter. So, how would you set up graphics when developing a game? You'd probably do something where you place everything onto a frame and then send it to the graphics processor to draw it. At least, that's how it's done now. 
On the 2600, though, there was no video memory, so they had to do something else. And to demonstrate what they had at the time, I'm going to set this video's resolution to 480i. Ah yes, isn't this beautiful? Wonderful interlaced footage. On a CRT television common for the 80s, there's an electron beam lighting up pixels with colors from left to right, and it draws a picture by scanning vertically line by line. An NTSC television, common in the United States, had 525 scan lines, which enabled this beautiful 480i resolution. A frame on the Atari 2600, though, has half the vertical resolution of a normal TV. So, 262 scan lines. And of those 262 scan lines, only 192 of them are actually used to draw pixels. So, uh, what are the other ones used for? Well, there's actually no way to turn the electron beam off, so it's constantly drawing to the screen. So, for 37 scan lines above the picture and 30 scan lines below, we don't draw anything, specifically so that we can process game logic. The remaining three are used to sync the frame up. So, in a typical game loop for the 2600, game logic occurs during the vertical blank, then we draw the picture in a stage known as the kernel, and then there's 30 lines of overscan, which can be used for even more logic if that's necessary. Oh, and by the way, can I get my full video resolution back? I'm pretty sure the audience knows what 480i looks like now. <sighs> okay... Ew, I hate HD video, it's too detailed. In 6502 assembly, the easiest way to create a game loop is by having a go-to statement jump backwards in the code. In the loop, there's some vsync to start the frame, and then we're in the vertical blank. During the blank, we use a timer to sleep until 37 scan lines since the start of past, and then we wake up the TIA to begin the kernel, which loops for 192 frames, counting the frame number in the Y register. After that, there's 30 overscan lines of... NOTHING! And that's an extremely simple 2600 game loop. Oh, and if any of that goes wrong, this is what the Atari emulator spits at you. But if everything goes right, we get a stable display. Now we can, for example, give it a background color by setting the background color register on the TIA. The processor itself has three registers, A, X, and Y, and we load a color from this table into A, and store A into C-O-L-U-B-K to set a background color. Now we have grass, I guess. But what if we want to add a player? Well, the TIA makes this somewhat less painful because it has two whole sprites it can display, alongside missiles for each of them and a neutral ball to kick around. It can also display a 40 by 192 background image that gets stretched by width a bunch and repeated because we have no memory here. Oh, so the Atari 2600 was made with just combat in mind. Nice. We can make our 8x8 sprite by declaring some bytes below the game loop. Sprites are only one color, so it can be drawn using ones and zeros. Also, it has to be upside down. Now we can begin drawing the sprite. First, you'd want to store the Y position of the sprite and the current scan line of the sprite into the 128 bytes of RAM. Then, in the kernel, you'd want to check if the current scan line matches the Y position. If it does, load 8 into our player's visible scan line count. Then, load in the player's scan line, draw it by storing the graphics into the GRP0 register on the TIA, and then decrement the visible line so that we draw the next line. Lastly, if the visible line is already zero, just skip drawing altogether. Now we're drawing a player! That... can't move. No matter, in the much less difficult to program game logic section of the code during the vertical blank, we simply read the joystick and move the player up and down by incrementing and decrementing the Y position. Now he's moving. So you can set his vertical position, but how do you set the horizontal position? There seems to be nothing in the code so far about the player's horizontal positioning. Oh, that. Do you want to know how to position a sprite horizontally on the Atari 2600? Um, yes? You skip to the beginning of the next scan line, wait a bit, and then set something to the reset horizontal position register, which sets the horizontal position of the sprite not to the value you send to it, that would make too much sense. 
but the sprite's X position is set to where the beam is currently at on the TV. What? Why is it like that? <laughs> Who cares? It's great! No, it's not great. What do we do when we actually want to position the sprite somewhere? Sleep the processor, of course. Yeah, this is why the game doesn't use the X position that much. Moving on, we're going to use the other sprite that the TIA has to store the enemy. He has his own sprite data, but it's drawn in a very similar way to the player. And of course, his game logic takes in no input, and he follows you sometimes. I didn't want him to follow you all the time though, so he only follows you sometimes. Both the player and the enemy have their colors set in the TIA in a very similar way to the background. So, now there's a whole three colors being displayed on the screen at once. Hooray! Now, theoretically, all we need to do is add the missile and the score, and the game will be good to go. First, we'll start with displaying the score. The score is something that sounds like it should be simple to do. I mean, it's just a number that gets printed on the screen. But you already know that the hardware will not be helping us at all with actually displaying this number. So how do we display a number? Well, I'll be using a method from the Let's Make a Game post by Daryl Spice Jr. The number graphics, which we have to make ourselves, are stored in a similar way to the sprites at the bottom of the file. And because we're working at such a low level, the score is actually in hexadecimal, so we need to give it the letters A through F, as well as the digits 0 through 9. For actually drawing the score, we first split the score into the 1's digit and the 10's digit. Then we draw these digit graphics onto the playfield. And the code is duplicated twice, because that's the easiest way to make the graphics slightly larger. By default, they're too short. Oh, and by default, they also show up twice. Why? Because the playfield graphic is only for half of the screen, and they assume you're drawing it twice on both sides of the screen. But we're not doing that. What do we do to fix this? Well, we simply don't draw the graphic until after the electron beam has passed halfway through the screen. How? By keeping track of how many cycles on the TV each instruction takes. There's no other way around it. That's why it's on the right side, by the way. It's much easier to draw it on the right side after changing all the data than it would be to draw it on the left side before changing all the data. And also, because we don't have a score yet, I have it draw the player's Y coordinate for debug purposes. So now it works! And it was painful to set up, even while following a guide. The last thing to add is the missile, which should be similar to the player and enemy and hopefully be easier than the score. In addition to the two player sprites, the TIA also lets us draw a missile graphic, which is a block of variable size. So we can just draw it on the screen and give it a horizontal speed so it moves left on the screen and... Oh. Oh no, what the heck? Why is it, why, why is it cheering? Oh. It seems that your kernel is taking longer than it's allowed to per scan line! <laughs> oh, great. So, uh, I used this method that's also from the How to Make a Game series, where it just draws things on alternating lines, cutting our effective resolution in half, which I honestly think looks better. One of the reasons it looks better is because it's not shearing. By this point, you're probably not surprised that Pac-Man had all that flickering going on. When it comes to collisions with the missile, the TIA, surprisingly, provides its own way to detect collisions between sprites and missiles. This is like one of the three things it can do. So, we set a dead boolean when that happens, and when the dead boolean is 1, the colors are set to red and the game doesn't let anything move anymore. I also gave it a beep. Hooray. And lastly, scoring points. This is done using a janky frame timer because I was almost fed up with this. And because the players might not understand hexadecimal, I had it skip A through F when counting your score. So when it hits 10, it just goes to 10, 1, 0, which is actually 16. So now we have an entire game written for the Atari 2600. Yes, it sucks. Yes, it's really easy to just rack up points, but hey, it's a functional game written in 6502 for the Atari 2600. Also, something called Batari Basic exists to hopefully make this easier, but that's lame. 
And now, I'm never going to complain about any other game engine again. That's a lie, but honestly, it will always be able to get worse. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.